Welcome to Beer in Bourbon Studios. I'm Jessica. This is Bryce. And we are your game and drink connoisseurs. And this is the Game and Drink Connoisseurs Podcast. So here we are, wife, smack dab in the middle of spring. Yes, springtime, or as Arizonans call it, first summer. It, it is the first summer. Uh, we typically in this country call springtime allergy season, but in Arizona, especially here in southern Arizona, it's allergy season year round. That is also true. So we get allergies all year and we get two summers. What more could you ask for? I think I could ask for a lot more weather wise, but let's be real, no one's going to listen or care. So instead, I'll ask to just play a springtime board game and What's more springtime than honeybees? Today's game is Honey Buzz. This is an engine building economic game all about maximizing your beehive, meeting customer demand, and strategically manipulating the bee economy. <laughs> you see what I did there? Yeah. To help us do all that to great effect, we also have Brain Boost Super Green Tea by the Republic of Tea. Like that Gladiator Glory coffee we talked about a few weeks ago, this tea is packed with adaptogens designed to help keep you sharp and focused throughout your day. We also have some interesting facts about bees, and then we're closing the show out today with some information about whether or not honey can be used to combat allergies. So, Jessica, before we dive into the show today, uh, I want to take a second to talk about something that happened between the last show and now. We had put some feelers out to get some feedback from our listeners, and it turns out people had a lot to tell us, mostly in positive and constructive ways. That's right. One particular piece of feedback was from Tim of Board Game Rundown. He had some really well-articulated critiques, and and based on his feedback, we're actually going to make a major change immediately starting in this episode. We're changing our Just the Tip segment. We're calling it Behind the Bar. That's right. Just the Tip gone behind the bar is now the segment name. Sometimes you just need that third-party perspective, and that is what Tim of the Board Game Rundown did. By the way, Board Game Rundown, check that out on YouTube. Terrific channel. Those guys are awesome. Tim was really cool, took some time to talk to me, and he was like, you know, I like the show, but the just the tip thing just seems way out of left field. You got 40 minutes of talking about a board game and a thematically fitting drink, and then all of a sudden, here comes this tongue-in-cheek sexual connotation, and it's just kind of like, whoa, what the fuck? Yeah, it's going to fit a lot better, and it's going to be less kind of out of nowhere. And it's so funny. Once he said that, it was immediately like, oh, my gosh, you're totally right. Why would we never we never realized how random it was because it just it's just our humor. But, yeah, it doesn't fit the show. And hopefully behind the bar will it's going to be the same segment at heart in terms of the content. We're just giving it the title and the intro a little bit of a facelift. Exactly. And, you know, you you want your bartender or your barista to be knowledgeable about the things that we talk about, hopefully. So, yeah, I I think it's going to fit. Quick shout outs also to uh, Devin of the new podcast, Roll and Reflect. Check that one out. The podcast is really cool. He's also an admin to a Facebook group we're both a part of called the Board Game Hype Community, one of the best board game groups out there on Facebook, in our opinion. Also, a shout out to Jake from the Decision Space podcast. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of love out there for each other in the podcast space when it comes to board games. Tim, Devin, and Jake have proven to be the exception. They're talking to us. They're chatting with us. So give their shows a listen. Return the love. Yeah, it's definitely appreciated to have some positive interactions when when it seems like there's just a lot of weird animosity between different content creators. So thank you, Tim, Devin, and Jake. And again, spread the love. Give their shows a listen. Okay, enough yapping from us. Let's get into today's episode. I have here our first cups of Brain Boost Super Green Tea by Republic of Tea. When we come back, we'll be taking a deep dive into Honey Buzz. But first, let's learn a little more about today's brew. Brain Boost Super Green Tea is brought to you by the Republic of Tea, a leading purveyor of premium teas founded in Larkspur, California in 1992. 
While based in Northern California, the Republic of Tea is dedicated to sourcing the finest ethical, organic, and gluten-free teas from all over the world. The Republic of Tea's Organic Brain Boost Super Green Tea features a blend of green tea leaves, Japanese matcha powder, and ginkgo biloba extract, making it a powerful source of cognitive benefits. Green tea leaves are full of antioxidants and believed to help increase mental energy. There's even some evidence to suggest that green tea can increase fat burning, protect the brain from aging, and decrease the risk of certain diseases such as cancer and diabetes. Japanese matcha is a fine powder made from specially grown green tea leaves with a higher concentration of chlorophyll, which boosts the health benefits. According to Republic of Tea, the matcha powder enhances mental focus when added to this brain-boosting blend. Ginkgo biloba is another strong source of antioxidants. It is believed to have many medicinal uses, but its purpose in this brew is to improve memory. Added to this trifecta of mind-enhancing ingredients are natural honey and black currant flavors, complementing the crisp green tea and giving it a hint of sweetness. Sounds promising enough, but will Brain Boost Super Green Tea give us the needed edge to best balance the complexities of honeybee economics? We'll find out soon enough. In the meantime, if this has piqued your interest, you can check out Brain Boost Super Green Tea and all that the Republic of Tea has to offer by going to republicoftea.com. Spring has sprung in Sweetwater Grove, and the bees have discovered economics. You've been entrusted to manage a portion of the hive to produce honey and improve the bee economy. Sell this honey in bulk to the bear market or fulfill specific orders placed by the woodland critters. Forage, build, produce, and sell, all while vying for the queen's favor. Honey Buzz is a worker placement, engine building, economy driven game by Elf Creek Games. It is designed for 1 to 4 players, plays in 45 to 90 minutes, and is recommended for ages 10 and up. Given that everything is starting to bloom in our yard and we have some flowering plants, I wish the bees around here were as friendly looking as the ones on the box for this game. Yeah, so do I. It's a little bit scary, actually the Africanized bees in this area. They're territorial and aggressive. Whereas the bees in this game are friendly and just out to make money. Yes, it's, it's quite the difference. Anyway, the objective in Honey Buzz is pretty simple. Be the hive with the most money by the end of the game. And you do that by designing an economic powerhouse of a hive, collecting pollen, producing and selling honey, and winning the queen's contests. So let's talk about setup here. Like most games, it's going to be split off into two different areas. Your central kind of communal play area and then the player area. The central play area is going to have a hive board. And on this board, you're going to have hive tiles, queen's contest cards. We'll talk all about those in more detail later on. You're also going to have your woodland board. And this is going to be where your forge and field area is. You're going to have nectar tokens. There's going to be a market value tracker, along with some cards that indicate orders from the woodland creatures. In the general supply, you're going to have coins, pollen, and these rubbery kind of spongy honey bits, which we'll get into later. They're really weird, but really cool. In the player area, each player has their player board, which is just kind of where you store your stuff. And you have your starting hive tiles, Everybody gets a fan token, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, you have a pool of worker beeples. You start with just one, put the rest kind of in the general supply. And I just want to say beeple. That's what they call them. It's really yes. funny. Beeples. They're the meeples, but they're bees. And everyone gets a forge token. You get a configuration card, some coins, and a player aid. So before you begin, everyone's going to look at their personal configuration card that's going to be different for everyone unless you're playing on easy mode. And this card's going to tell you how to set up your starting hive tiles. Now you can put whatever tile you want in whichever place you want to, but the hive has to be set up according to your card. Once you do that, you want to randomly place the nectar tiles all over the forage board. You're going to set the market values at top dollar. You are going to reveal the first series of order cards as well as the Queen's Contest, and once you do that, you're ready to start. Taking a turn has two possible actions. The first action is to take a tile. 
The tiles you take are gonna come from the hive board and the hive board is broken up into different sections, each one with a specific hive location tile and the tiles have a corresponding action. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. But to choose a hive location tile, you've gotta stack your beeples and place them in that location. What you have to remember is that you have to have one more beeple in your stack than the highest stack that's already in that location in order to pull a tile from there. So if it's completely empty, you put one bee down or beeple. If there's one already there, whether it's yours or someone else's, you have to put a stack of at least two beeples in order to pull a tile from there. Now, once you've chosen whatever hive tile you want, you take it and you add it to your hive. The hive tiles, and I don't know how else to describe this, but they're like two hexagons connected by one side. So you have 10 sides total. Four of those sides are yellow and the rest are either red or cream colored. And we'll talk more about those sides later. But anyway, you wanna connect the yellow sides in different patterns to create kind of a circle or a cell, as the game calls it, with an empty space in the center. Now, this won't necessarily happen every turn, but once you complete a cell, you are going to take all applicable hive actions within that cell. And we'll talk more about those actions in a minute. But I will note here that every tile, like I said, is two hexagons connected. On one side is going to be an empty space and on the other side is going to be an action. So that may affect or influence how you set up the tile in order to complete the cell and then take all those actions. The other action you can take while taking a turn is to recall your workers. And sometimes you're forced to do this because you've already sent all of your beeples out into the hive, but sometimes you can just do it because you want to. So when you recall your workers, you take every single one of them back from the hive board to your player board, and now they're ready to be used again. You also have the option to move your forage token one space in the forage field. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So now let's talk about some of these actions you can take whenever a cell is completed. The first one we'll talk about is making a new beeple. If you trigger this action, you're going to take one of your beeples that are sitting off to the side, and you're going to put them in the nursery space on the main board. And the next time you recall your workers, you get to take that beeple and put it into your own little player board, and then you can use it in all future turns. The next kind of action you can take is the forage action. This action allows you to move your forage token one space through the field for free. If you wanna move more spaces, you can actually pay two coins per space to move further. And wherever you land, you can take that nectar tile, but you can only take it if you have a hexagonal cell that matches the pattern of the outline of that nectar tile. So we talked about how those cells have, or how the hive tiles have red and cream colored outlines. Those are gonna make up a pattern and that matches to the patterns outside of the different type of nectar tiles. So if you take a nectar tile, you can put it into the empty cell that it matches. If you don't wanna take a nectar tile or you can't take a nectar tile, you can take a pollen instead. Now, once you have those nectar tiles in your cells, you're going to want to produce honey from them. And to do this, you take a produce action you have a little fan token that comes with all your other stuff and you place that fan token in your hive to produce honey from any nectar space that it touches. The way the cells are designed, you can produce up to three different honeys at once with this action. Once you produce the honey, you take the little honey pieces, those rubbery weird pieces we talked about earlier, you put them on top of the cell and now you have honey to use from that cell when you go to the market. This is so long as the cell doesn't have honey on it already. The next hive action you can take is the market action. And this one actually gives you one of two options. The first option is to complete an order. The orders are cards that have a picture of a woodland creature and the items that that creature is ordering. It also will have a cost that he's willing to pay for those items. So typically it's various types of honey. Occasionally there's pollen on the order as well. And what you're gonna do is turn in those items that are listed on the card. You take the card and you set it aside and it's going to come in handy at the end of the game. The market orders also have a special bonus action depending on where the card is placed on the board. So once you've taken your market order, you can take that bonus action, which is just one of the different hive actions. You just get to do it for free. The other option is to just sell to the market. You can sell honey or pollen to the market for the listed price, depending on where it's at, 
on the price scale. But every time you sell it, you're going to have to lower the value for the next time it's sold. For example, you could sell pollen for six coins. And if you have more than one pollen, you're selling each of those for six coins each. But after your turn is complete, you're going to lower the value of the pollen. So next time it's sold, it's only worth five coins each. The next action you can take is a simple one. It is the accounting action. And all you do here when you activate this action is take five coins from the supply. The last action you can take is the decree action. This is the only tile that actually costs money to procure and for five coins you give it into your cell and when you activate it, it's essentially a wild card. It acts as any other action that we've already talked about. So when you activate the decree, you can take five coins, you can go to the market, you can produce, you can forage, or you can make a new beeple. So those are the different actions you can take on your turn. We also mentioned that there are Queen's Contest cards on the Hive board. Now there's two different types of Queen's Contests. Some of them are first two contests, so it's like a race. So during the game, after you take a turn, you wanna pay attention and find out if you have reached one of those milestones. Because if you have, you're going to immediately gain the reward that is listed on the card. The other type of Queen's Contest is scored at the end of the game, and that's going to depend on your sort of end game accomplishments. So those ones you can ignore until it's time for final scoring. The game will end when four of the resource values on the market board drop to the very bottom, or two order piles out of three have been run empty. You add together your coins, any surplus of honey you might have, the Queen's Contest points, and then the points listed on your order cards that you've obtained throughout the game. The player with the most points will win. Check remaining resources and completed orders if tied. If it's still tied after that, well, you just share the victory. Sounds like some f***ing commie gobbledygook. So that's pretty much the gist of Honey Buzz. It's a really simple game, actually. There's only a couple of different actions you can take, but the strategies, that's where the meat of it really is, and that's where it gets really complicated. The first strategy we would suggest for winning this game is to get more beeples early on. It allows for more tile selection sooner because you don't have to waste turns recalling your workers. You don't need too many. You don't have to have all of your beeples, but you want to make sure you have a good amount. I noticed the last time we played, you went with the strategy of using the fewest beeples possible, and it made you have to recall those workers more frequently, whereas I had more beeples than you, and I was able to spread out which tiles I wanted a little longer than you, which means I was activating more cells. Yeah, it definitely gave you an advantage in that game. The next piece of advice I would give is to plan your game around your initial setup. The configuration card you get more than likely will set your tiles up in a way to where a cell is almost complete. And you can set those tiles whichever way you want to, but no matter how you set them up, take a look at which nectar tiles are already going to fit in the pattern that is kind of almost already there. Take a look at what's on the forage field. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a second and see what you can most closely get to. This is important because Honey Buzz is not one of those games that will allow you to build a hive which will give you access to all the different things. So it's important to take a look at what head start you already have going for yourself and take advantage of that and lean into that as much as you can. So to piggyback off of that, you also want to try to build your honey cells in clusters of the same type of nectar, which will produce the same type of honey. So that way when you do your produce action and you're producing up to three different honeys, they're all the same type. And what's great about this is that number one, there's only a limited amount of nectar of each type in the forage area. So if you snatch them all up, your opponents are now no longer able to produce that type of honey. But also, it allows you to sell it in bulk. So when you take your market actions, you're able to make a lot of money with one market action by selling multiples of the same type of honey. This is actually something you did in a game where you absolutely fucking annihilated me. You were able to build a cluster of rosemary honey or whatever it was, and you were just selling them in threes every time, and you racked up a ton of money this way. Yeah, and I think you weren't even able to get any rosemary during that game. So I really screwed with your ability to hit the market orders, which was what you were focusing on in that game. 
And I think we really cracked the code on that one on how to get a huge advantage. Well, yeah, I was trying to go for orders and you were just selling directly to the market because you only had that one type of honey in your hive. So you weren't ever going to hit the orders, but what you could do was sell to the market and you were raking in a lot of the coins, but you were also bringing those market values down, bringing you closer to the end of the game. Yeah, that gave me a huge advantage. And on that note, because that's a strategy people can take, you want to make sure you're grabbing the nectar you need before other people do. Because if somebody manages to get a cluster and you're not able to make that type of honey at all, it can really screw with your game. So pay attention to what's out there and go for it while you can. Yeah, you can have these cells that you build, but they're left completely empty, and then that renders them completely useless. Because once the cell's built, you can't tap into those actions again. You can tap into some of the actions if they touch other cells, but that particular cell, if it's not producing honey, it's useless, and it can take a while to build a cell. So if you're screwed out of nectar, or if you screw your opponents out of nectar, that can really put a damper in the way they play. As you mentioned, if you don't have a nectar in a particular cell, it becomes useless. And that's because you can only take the hive actions at the moment you complete the cell. So you want to be really strategic in the way that you group the tiles so that you can get a really good full turn out of completing that cell. Think about the fact that each piece is going to be in more than one cell too. So think about which orientation you're going to put the tiles so that you can maximize those actions and make your turns really full and active. And the best way to make your turns really full and active is to choose the actions you want to use strategically when you activate a cell. You have at your discretion which actions you want to activate in any given order when a cell is activated. So it's important to make sure that those actions help whichever action's about to come after them. For example, if I wanted to produce honey but my cell is empty, I might want to forage first and I might want to do those two things before I take that honey to the market. Pay attention to what your actions are and utilize them in the best way possible for you. Another really important strategy and this is going to sound kind of contradictory to what we said earlier, but you want to make sure you balance both the market and the orders because trying to lean too heavily towards one or the other could really waste a lot of time and give someone else an advantage to get ahead of you. And it really depends on how the nectar is laid out in the forage area and what's available to you, what's available in your hive, how your starting configuration sets you up. So you want to strike while the iron is hot for you. Try to keep a balance of doing some orders and some bulk sales if you can. But if you're only trying to go for the bulk sales of the one type of honey, that could end up wasting a lot of time while you're trying to build up that cluster of cells. Meanwhile, your opponent is getting a huge lead completing orders while you're building up that cluster. So definitely pay attention to the opportunities and don't stay kind of one track and hyper-focused on one thing. Well, yeah, because on the other hand, you could be focused on the orders entirely, like I was in this one game we played, and you're building your cells to complete the specific needs for one order, and your opponent, alternatively, is selling a bunch of honey. So like Jessica said, striking while the iron is hot for you, if the orders are leaning in your favor, take advantage of those. If the market's leaning in your favor take advantage of that. And definitely be adaptable because you could be going towards one particular order and somebody else completes that one. And then all of a sudden the next order is totally different. So make sure you're ready to kind of change strategies whenever you need to. Speaking of orders, each order, as Jessica said earlier, comes with a bonus action attached to it. When you complete the order, you get to take that bonus action. Take advantage of the bonus actions on those order spaces. The actions are a free uh, market action, a free forage action, or a free, what was the last one? Produce. Right. Take advantage of those. If you complete an order that drains you of all one type of honey, but then you get a free produce action to replicate that honey again, you could either sell it on the market next time or complete another order your next turn the possibilities increase for you to maximize your turn. And that's what this game is all about, maximizing everything and taking advantage of things out there while you can gain the most benefit from them. So those bonus actions 
can go a long way because it's free actions you otherwise would have had to build a whole other cell to get access to. Yeah, there was one game you and I played where you completed one order and it gave you a free market action. So you were able to complete another order immediately right away. And you pulled in like 15 points just in that one turn. It was pretty awesome. Well, if you remember, that second order gave me another produce action. And so my very next turn, I was able to complete another order. And I had a ton of orders by the end of the game. I think that was the one game that I actually won. I don't win this game often, but uh, when I do, (laughs) it was that one game. Another strategy is don't discount the pollen. When I first played this game, I thought, what's the point of it? It doesn't really contribute to most of the orders and it's not part of the cells and you get it kind of in a weird way, but it's actually really useful if you use it strategically. You can sell it in bulk for one and really gain a lot of money really quickly by doing that. As a reminder, the way you get pollen is by foraging and not taking a nectar. So every time you're recalling your workers, you have that option to forage. I would say definitely do it. Even if you can't get a nectar, you can get a pollen and build those up, sell them all at once, and make a lot of money. They're also in some of the orders, some of the more advanced orders. So you want to be sure to have them on hand so that if you do have an order that has it, you can throw it in there easily. If nothing else, too, they're a tiebreaker at the end of the game. True. Jessica, it is time to pour another cup of tea. When we come back, we are going to get into dislikes, likes, what other people said. But in the meantime, we are going to give you some fun facts about actual honeybees and how they work. You may have found yourself face to face with a bee or two before. That weird thing they do where they fly super close to your face is due to the carbon dioxide you exhale when you breathe. Bees hate the smell of it and consider it to be a threat. Try taking shorter breaths next time you find yourself near them. Despite their extremely close association with hives and colonies, the overwhelming majority of bee species live solitary lives. Female blue mason bees, for example, burrow right into the ground to make their nest and only interact with other bees when it's time to mate. Over 90% of a honeybee colony is made up of females. Male bees, otherwise known as drones, have it kind of rough. They're born without stingers, and they're expected to mate with the queens after being only a week old. Those that do mate immediately die right afterwards. Those who don't are forced out of the hive, completely defenseless and on their own, as they serve no function for the colony's survival anymore. A worker bee will typically spend its short life of only around two months flying around 90,000 miles, in search of near her own weight in pollen every forage, and will only make around one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in that time. Add that to the fact that she will almost never sleep, and it's easy to see that these busy little bees essentially work themselves to death. What a honeybee becomes is entirely based on their diet as a larva and pupil. Queen bees will be fed a substance known as royal jelly. Workers and drones will be fed fermented pollen and honey. There is usually more than one queen bee hatched and raised at once to ensure optimal survival of the colony in the future. However, once full grown, there can only be one, and a battle to the death amongst the queens will commence. Only the strongest will survive. Once a new queen emerges victorious, the old queen will break away from the hive with several workers and form a new hive elsewhere. Queens can also be created in a pinch by switching a young worker bee's diet to royal jelly, although the results are usually less than ideal. One of the more fascinating things about honeybees is how they communicate. They will dance and release pheromones to relay information regarding all kinds of things, but there is more to it than that. They have one of the most acute sense of smells in all the animal kingdom. They can use the sun to navigate, and they can recognize faces. They're also not born instinctively knowing how to forage pollen or make honey. They have to be taught how to do it by older worker bees. There is even some evidence to suggest that bees have their own personalities. All of this makes them far more than just a cog in the machine that is the hive. So Jessica, I think it's safe to say that Honey Buzz is a really good, well-made game. Would you agree? Absolutely. However, no game is perfect, and we will get some of our dislikes out of the way first. For me, Jessica, and this may just be a me thing, but this is definitely not a game for those who struggle to plan or focus. 
This is a very dense game when it comes to laying out your tiles properly, activating the cells properly, taking the turns properly, having it all work and ebb and flow for the market, which you also have to strategize with. It's a lot to think about. There's a lot of forward thinking in this. And uh, if you are not one for brain burning games, you're going to have a really miserable time playing this one, especially if you're playing against somebody who really thrives in that type of gaming environment. I would suggest playing with people at your level because otherwise it's going to be really unfun. On that note, the turns can take forever. Whether you're playing with people who struggle or just people who are perfectionists, it can take a long time to determine what you're going to do to maximize your actions or just to complete all of the actions in a cell, especially if you built your cell really well. So that can get kind of boring and feel like it's lagging if you're waiting for your opponent to take forever on their turn. This is almost a game, though, where you can sit there and go, okay, they're going to take forever. Let me look at my turn and what I need to do. There are games out there where it doesn't matter how long someone takes because it just means you get more time to think through your turn. However, enough happens here where by the time it gets back around to you, you have to rethink everything. Maybe somebody took a tile you needed. Maybe somebody put a beeple in an area you wanted to go, but now you can't. And so doing that almost seems kind of like a waste of time almost. And so, yeah, that, that waving around for perfectionists or people who have a hard time thinking, it can bore you to tears. Yes. Another thing we don't love about this game is the Queen's Challenge. Oh, I fucking hate this piece. Oh, I hate it so much. It just feels a little unnecessary. On the one hand, it sometimes can help you steer your game. It gives you a little bit of something to go for. But at the same time, it's not really worth it until it is. That's the problem with it, though, right? Because you have your whole game planned. You, you're playing the market well. You're setting up your hive right. And at the end of the game... Somebody just happens to get first place in a queen's contest that you didn't even need to go for. You couldn't go for it or else you wouldn't have gotten all the points you did. And just like that, they slide ahead and take the victory. That sucks. Yeah, and some of them seem kind of arbitrary. Like one of them was uh, the fewest cells or sorry, the most empty cells. Right. So you're building these cells just to leave them empty and then do nothing else with them. You're trying to build a big hive, I guess. That doesn't seem strategically sound because the game seems more about the market, not the queen's contest. But again, if you don't pay attention to it, somebody else can sneak in with the win. Yeah, it almost kind of seems like some of them are meant to give someone a leg up if they're in last place, right? The fewest peoples or the most empty cells, things like that. But then some of them are really about aggressive strategy, like having more than one of the same type of nectar or having three different types of nectar before anyone else, I feel like, especially if you have a weird combination of Queen's challenges, it can really make for an awkward game. It is an unnecessary distraction amongst an already complicated game, is what it is. If the game wasn't so complicated, and again, you see this in a lot of Euro-type worker placement type games, where you have these end goals that everyone can go for, and it usually works out. I mean, sometimes the game is kind of designed around these goals, here it is not. It's already very, very dense. I don't see the necessity for these Queen's Challenges at all. I would be curious to try playing a game without them and see if we even miss it at all. I probably wouldn't. But again, I have a hard time thinking these things through. For somebody who likes to think, this may be a, a really fun challenge that they enjoy. But yeah, I, I could live without them for sure. Another dislike for us, and this is a really small thing, but... There is a little bit too much luck of the draw in this game, and it can really render your hive useless. There's only two areas where luck really comes into play. One is the placement of the nectar tokens, and the other is the order cards that come out. But it can potentially make it so that you really can't get to the nectar that you need, or you're just unable to complete the orders that are out there. Yeah, imagine you're going fourth in a four-player game, and a lot of the nectar tiles of the same type are clumped up right up front, and... Everyone else scoops them all up before you get them. Now you can no longer make that honey at all. And let's say that honey is needed in all the order cards that come out. What are you supposed to do? Yeah, and this game can take a really long time to play. So if you have an ineffective hive, you're basically just sitting there waiting for someone else to win. And that's kind of a sucky feeling. Yeah, it's very, very boring. Uh, something else I noticed about this, completing orders almost seems to be not as effective 
as just selling the pollen and the honey outright. This isn't always the case. We definitely recommend you paying attention to both the market and the orders, but if somebody has a group of cells set up early on in the game and they're just selling honey, producing and selling it, they're going to rack up way more points than you ever will completing just the orders. It kind of makes the game feel one-sided when this happens. I don't know how often this happens, but it's happened, what, twice out of the four games we've played. That's a lot. It's definitely something to think about and something to question because it seems like going for that bulk sale strategy kind of is a universal win. Although it hasn't always worked out that way for us. So maybe it's not as unbalanced as it seems to us. Right. Maybe that's just the way it's played out. But it leaves me wondering if that scenario does happen, does it break the game? It's a good question. And I'm not sure the answer to that. But I think a few more plays and we'll have a better idea. Now that we got the bad stuff out of the way, let's talk about what we like about this game. First and foremost, we love that it's a very complex puzzle. It is fantastic for anyone who likes a real challenge. It can make you better over time. It's got a really high replay value, and the more times you play it, the better your brain becomes, which is fantastic. That's what board games are supposed to be. And the variant mode provides even further challenges, so you can kind of tailor the game to the level of difficulty that you want. This is a game I definitely struggle with personally, but taking my own opinion outside of it, it's a very well-made game for the reasons Jessica just listed. Games were meant to be played again and again and again and discovering new things and getting better as you go. This game is a perfect example of one of those games and you will always enjoy a play because it's always going to give you something new to think about so long as we didn't discover a way to break the game, I guess. Right, and I don't think we did. I think hopefully we're wrong about that, but only time will tell, right? right? Another thing we like about the game is that it captures competitive economics really well. The way they deal with limited resources, with maximization, the number of workers that you have, and the devaluation of the resources as they get sold, it's all just a really good representation of economic competition. It's very deep, but also simple, which is amazing, right? It's For all its complexities, it's really easy to learn. Absolutely. There's only like three things that can happen on your turn, and it's very easy to pick up and go, okay, I see what I have to do. The beauty of this game is learning how to do it properly. And speaking of beauty, let's talk about the artwork. Let's talk about the component quality. Stellar. Absolutely amazing. I was talking about those honey pieces that are like kind of rubbery. They're great. I've never seen other pieces like it before. You can tell that they're going to last a long time, but also the cardstock is really good. The artwork itself is great. It's colorful. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's a really beautiful game. The beeples are adorable and really well-made wood. The pastel color palette is just wonderful. The weird honey pieces we've mentioned, they have a translucent quality that makes them really look like a dab of honey. And yeah, that's, that, that's what it is. I've been trying to figure out what they were going for, like a drop of honey. Yeah. Exactly. What's funny about the the artwork, because it's all these cute woodland critters, and you got like squirrels hanging off of trees, and bears, and wolves, and stuff. Very misleading, because this game is fucking hard. It is very hard compared to how cute it looks. It almost looks like it's designed for kids, but as an adult, I find it to be quite the challenge. Yeah, what would they say? This game was designed for kids like 10 and up? No way as a 10-year-old I figure this game out. <laughs> I probably could have played this game at 10. But... but that artwork is so goddamn misleading. My yeah. goodness. But it's beautiful. I can't say enough about it. It's uh, one of the better games in our collection anyway when it comes to artwork. Probably would make a top 10 list of mine. As always, we polled other people, and most people have given this game very high praise. People especially love how the engine building works. They say that other games usually end right before the engine gets going, and this game doesn't do that. People really like that, and I'd have to agree with that. This game isn't going to allow you to do 
everything, but it will allow you to build the engine you want to build so long as you build it with a strategy in mind. And I think that's really important that it pays off for you in that way. Could you imagine the game being as hard as it is to, you know, to line up all the pieces but not let you utilize the thing that you built? Well, I mean, that's a problem that I think a lot of people have with a lot of engine building games. And is, that's a fair critique. Yeah, absolutely. But at the same token, you're not getting bored with it, right? You don't have a problem where you build your engine early on and you're just over and over doing the same thing until you're like, God, is it over yet? It's got a very good balance in terms of the timing of the game. Another thing other people really liked, and this is not something you and I get into much, but people loved the solo mode. They say it's very easy to work the Automa player. I've been calling it a computer player, like video game terms. Automa is what they call it in board gaming. But uh, they say it's really easy to work on the computer player, the Automa player, whatever, while they work their own game, which I imagine would be very important because of how dense this game is. Yeah, I definitely am going to want to try that one out. Most of the complaints people had are in regards to the Queen's Contest and two-player games, specifically those two things separately and also in conjunction. People say that it gives a heavy advantage to the first player in a two-player game, probably because the Queen's Contest in a two-player game only has a first prize instead of first, second, and third. Right, so if you go first, more than likely you're going to reach the goal first, and therefore you're going to rake in those points first. People also suggested house rules to try to balance that out. Also, the game drags ass. People did say that. We covered that in our own list of critiques. Uh, this was more of an observation than a complaint, although another game, which is very similar in theme, which is called Bees, which everyone compares this one to, is preferred for players who like faster play. But people do say, you know, you can take advantage of the time so that you can really plan your moves. I would say yes, except we've already talked about that if enough people go before you, the whole board can change, and then you're left sitting on your turn trying to plan your move and thus dragging ass a little more. Now, it's important to note, because there is an expansion, so we should just mention it here. It's the Fall Flavors expansion, and a lot of people have said that they've enjoyed it. To us, it just seems like more stuff, but it does have a popular response out there. I would probably guess if you've played it enough, it might add to the replayability. We're not there yet, and we don't have the expansion, so we don't really know. But if that's not really what you're looking for, I wouldn't go for it just for the price. Yeah, the price is like 100 bucks or something, isn't it? Yeah, but it is aesthetically, it's really pretty. It is very pretty, but again, this, this idea of more stuff, and I am going to harp on this just a tad. If you're chasing goals and honey buzz, and you're trying to put together your engine and fulfill the market things and all this, I'm willing to bet that by adding more stuff, it takes away from the stuff that's already good about the game. Is it even worth it at that point? Like you said, we haven't taken a good look at it, even without knowing a whole lot about it. At the risk of sounding like an arrogant and completely ignorant asshole, wouldn't advise the expansion. All in all, though, it's a great game, really great quality, thematically sound, but only if you like or want a dense challenge. True. My personal thoughts of how hard it is aside, again, this game is great. I would recommend that you play this with people at your level specifically. But if you do that, you are going to have a wonderful time. You're going to have a game that is going to sit on your shelves for a long time because there's always something new to discover here. There is always something to get you thinking here. Definitely look up Honey Buzz, and if it's for you, give it a try. I don't think you'll be disappointed. So now that we have had an entire episode to sample Brain Boost Super Green Tea by Republic of Teas, Jessica, let us talk about it right off the bat. I'm a fan of this one. I am too. I am normally not a green tea person, but I, I really enjoy this one. Green teas to me seem like the most unappealing tea. I've always found green tea to be the teas that taste the most like grass, and therefore I do not like them and I try to avoid them. This one, however, breaks that mold entirely. Yeah, it's a really wonderful formula. I don't know how they put it together, but it just really works. Yeah, everything inside 
of that tea bag kind of complements everything else. Let's start with before you brew the tea. You open up the can. Looks like a bag of green tea. It comes in a little brown bag. It smells like berries. Yeah, the black currant really comes through strongly in the aroma. Once you brew it, tastes pretty good. You get that aroma of the berries and flowers and all that stuff. It is really pleasant. It's got just a hint of sweetness in it that's not overwhelming, but it really cuts the bitterness that I associate with green tea. It's the black currant, I feel like, is very heavily in there, but in a good way. If you don't know what that tastes like, like I don't, you will find yourself sipping this and going, what is that? But it does make the tea stand out for green tea a lot. What do you think about the matcha in there as far as taste? I don't know much about matcha. I don't know what it's supposed to taste like. I know that when you're drinking your tea, the matcha will will slip through the bag and sink to the bottom. So you're going to have a lot of sediment in this cup. But do you know anything about matcha flavor or aroma, anything like that? Yeah, matcha... In my experience, I mean, a lot of people drink it with milk instead of whisking it with water. So it has a much richer, creamier taste. It's really just like a highly concentrated green tea. I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but it usually tastes a little bit, in my opinion, less bitter and richer, definitely richer. Now, let's not overlook the honey element in here, too, because there is that amongst that. What's that stuff called? Black currant. Amongst that black currant and amongst those berry flower aromas, you also get a tinge of honey sweetness when you drink this tea as well. Again, most green tea to me just tastes like whatever grass it comes from. But because of this honey sweetness, there's something very, very light on your palate. And then there's that bitterness from the green tea. And then you get that floral kind of aftertaste of the the currant and the, the berry flowers. Very, very pleasant. This is the second brew where it claims to enhance a part of you. We did Gladiator Glory, which was packed with a lot of vitamins, B vitamins especially, to give you a boost of energy. This tea claims to do the same with different ingredients. We didn't give this tea as much time to sample as we did Gladiator Glory, but Jessica, do you feel any different drinking this tea so far? It definitely is energizing, And I think it did offer a little bit of mental clarity, but it's hard to say because, you know, it hasn't been that long that we've really tried it. It's it gives you kind of the caffeine without the sort of jitters that you get from coffee. The combination of green tea leaves with the matcha powder is like super energizing or at least in my experience. But I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. I don't think it's like magic. I don't think we should expect magic in any of these drinks that claim to boost this or that. I don't think that's what it's supposed to feel like. If you drank like a Red Bull or a five-hour energy, it's meant to make you feel like you're super jolted, which is kind of gross, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think in time, drinks like these can improve your overall health, but I also think you have to be doing other health-conscious things in conjunction with this tea. You could eat pepperoni pizza every day with this tea. I don't think you're going to feel the effects. And also, this one isn't so much the added adaptogens like in the last one. It's really just the natural ingredients. Um, Green tea in general is known to have a lot of antioxidants. The ginkgo biloba is used a lot uh, for like memory enhancement. Well, whether or not it boosts our brains, this green tea is delicious. If you are the type of person who doesn't like coffee, you prefer the caffeination of green tea, This one is going to be amazing because there is a lot of flavor here, but they all complement each other. Nothing is too overpowering. And it still tastes like a green tea with just some added, oh, hey, that's really nice. Absolutely. I cannot stress enough how well-balanced and well-crafted the flavor is in this beverage. And I would definitely recommend it to anyone looking for a unique green tea to add to their routine. Hey, it's Bryce here from Behind the Bar. Brew food and mixology tips for a better drinking experience. And you know what? That does sound a lot better. Today's tip is more of a myth buster, if anything. But given the time of year and that Honey Buzz is a game all about honey, we thought it was appropriate. There's been a long-standing belief that eating localized honey during the spring season can help combat allergies. 
Turns out that's not entirely true, and we're going to break down why on today's visit behind the bar. The theory behind this belief is logical enough. It's based on the concept of immunotherapy, which is the practice of exposing yourself to small amounts of an allergen until you're able to tolerate it. This practice is widely used by medical professionals in the form of allergy shots and is scientifically proven to work, in most cases anyway. The problem with using local honey, however, is that it likely won't contain the pollens that you're allergic to. The flowering plants bees pollinate are not the typical weeds, trees, and grasses that cause most seasonal allergies. Generally speaking, the science just doesn't back up this age-old home remedy. However, there was one study in 2013 that showed an improvement in allergy symptoms after eight weeks of consuming local honey in conjunction with an antihistamine. If this sounds like a combo you might want to try, let me cover my ass right now by stating that I am not a doctor. And if you are currently taking or thinking about taking any antihistamines, you should first consult with your doctor, especially before mixing in anything else. It also bears mentioning that there are certain risks associated with consuming local unprocessed honey as it may contain mold spores or other dangerous substances. But again, I am not a medical professional. Consult with your doctor for all allergy-related questions. This is more about debunking than anything else, saving you time and effort as you, like most of the rest of us, do your best to combat your allergies this season. But hey, either way, honey is delicious and can be used to great effect when adding just a drop of sweetness in your tea. So if nothing else, we at least have that going for us, regardless of how congested we might be until July. With that, I raise my glass, toast to your health, and hope to see you next time from behind the bar. Cheers. That's all we have for today. Thank you for listening. We are going to be taking a little bit of a break next week, a little mini vacay. But when we come back, we're going to be unboxing the idea of using sand timers to time your turns. If I had a cool dollar to bet, I would say we made at least a few people cringe just now. I feel like it's a visceral subject. People are going to have a reaction to the extreme one way or the other, either very in favor or very anti so that'll be a very interesting discussion. Yeah, well, that's what makes it so fun. If you haven't already, like, follow us, subscribe on all the things. We're on Facebook. We're on X. We're on uh, YouTube. In fact, check out our YouTube channel if you like videos. We don't have a whole lot out there, but what's out there we think is pretty good. Anyway, until next time, I am Bryce. That is Jessica. We will catch you later. <laughs>